Cabo Hotel was the best place to do a little trolling. That's a classic. Pools closed and all that. So good. Like, I don't even know what the actual game was. I just remember going on there to fuck with people. And I feel like that's what everyone did. I don't think there was Cabo a game there. Hotel is a self-described virtual community for teens. At its peak in 2012, it had customers from 150 different Maybe countries, up 273 in the million registered users, and saw 5 million unique visitors every month. Habo was essentially Club Penguin for teenagers. You could visit places, chat to people, play games, and make your own rooms. You could play However, games in here? there is one thing that <laughs> dominates all that's aspects news to me. of Habo life. Coins. Coins Fuck could yeah. buy you the latest furniture, the nicest clothing, and Habo Club, a form of premium membership to distinguish you from the peasants. The issue with coins is that they can't be obtained through normal gameplay. You have to buy them with Maybe real life so. money. This means that coins have actual monetary value, and some players have sold their virtual currency for thousands of dollars. With the prospect to make actual real life money, Habo turned from a glorified oh. chat room to a terrifying experiment of anarcho capitalism done on teenagers and adolescents. I didn't children. remember that. Anarcho so kind of like RuneScape gold can selling? generally be characterized by three main points, and Habo ticks all of the boxes. One, anarcho capitalist societies are anarchists, which means that there is no central government control. In 2012, Habo employed 225 moderators worldwide. Now, there are zero moderators. All of them have been replaced by artificial intelligence, which only serves to censor bad words. The lack mark. of any real moderation has led to the proliferation of scams and illegal casinos throughout the hotel. Real casinos? The second characteristic of an Maybe they'll sponsor Steve, we'll do it next. Capitalism, which by Aiden Roscoe's on stream. Hey guys, you heard of Habo Hotel Gambling? controlled by private owners for profit rather than the state. Habo is defined by capitalism. Coins will never be given out by Habo unless they are purchased. Trading is a key aspect within the game and it isn't regulated or moderated. And finally, the last characteristic of anarcho-capitalist societies is that they are a mecca for pedophiles. Was there a big pedophile problem on Habo Hotel? These this two is deep. conditions have led Hebo to turn into an emulation of a free market capitalistic and materialistic society. Their adolescent and teenage Hype players cannon? end up turning into Maybe ruthless this. capitalists in order to survive. New players who join Habo Hotel start off with zero coins. The God, only yeah, way for players there. to get coins are to either pay for them or to get them from someone else. Giveaways are the breadlines of Habo. In the absence of government, the privatized welfare state steps in. Giveaways are events where rich Habos donate furniture and coins to peasants in need. You may be tempted to think that this charity is altruism at work. It isn't. This is an example of a giveaway. Mm -hmm. You may be confused as to why there Join are my free gift card giveaway. In a giveaway like the ones found in theme parks. This isn't unusual. When there is no regulation or moderation, I like that this guy's grooving. Whatever they want as giveaways. That's a classic. In reality, Fuck, this is a for-profit game. In order to win coins, you first need to roll a six in the dice. Next, you need to teleport to one of these green areas, which you have a 33.3% chance of doing. Pretty good. Finally, you need to pull a switch, which, assuming is not rigged, has a 50% chance of failure. Assuming you do all of that, you win the grand prize of one coin. Now, you could risk it. Pull the second switch, which, assuming is not rigged, Whoa. has another 50% chance of failure. That would bag you the grand prize of two coins. Crunching the numbers, Damn, this, you who, only they're have cruising. a 7 uh. chance of winning one coin. The chance of winning the jackpot of 50 coins? That's a 0.022% chance. I like those now odds. remember that I mentioned FastPass We earlier. win those. In these types of quote-unquote giveaways, the owner usually sells a FastPass, <laughs> which allows you to skip the long peasant queue and gives you slightly more favorable odds. 
but like a casino, these odds are stacked against you, and chances are you will not make Bo your money back. Bobo and once the only sells the fast passes for the day, they shut down the giveaway. And they open skill. a new one, still... under a new name, where you have to buy a new fast pass. Mm. No refunds given. But those aren't the only types of giveaways. There are other forms, such as radio giveaways, where players are forced to listen to a radio operated by a fan site. <laughs> Hello everyone, this is DJ Danny, and this is HappyQuest.com. What so the fuck is this? Alright. Classic. Yeah. No request, and... Oh, come on now. Someone request from Danny. Let's heart that shit. Uh, we're live. The DJ periodically tells the viewers the special keyword that is required before you can collect your duck or whatever the DJ feels like giving to you. This, of course, boosts traffic for the fan site, so they're earning money too. Real life money, that is. Then there are levers giveaways. Levers giveaways are run by rich habos who are no longer interested in the game. These type of giveaways usually attract the most attention, and these habos could be extremely generous. Or they could be trolls. In the absence of moderation, there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah, like who are you gonna call? The Better Business Bureau for Habo Hotel Scams? What are you gonna do, nerd? Dominate every Fool is of closed. Hotel. They have a special name. Agencies. In return for working in their corporation, you get paid coins. The amount each agency pays differs depending on pay policy. And like corporations in real life, agencies have tried to attract players in many ways. I don't want to. I don't want to get DMCA'd from fucking Habo Hotel. Jesus Christ! I didn't know about any of this shit. I just go into a lobby and say like, hey guys, fuck you. Welcome to the United Nations, the most innovative agency in Habo Hotel. We do things differently, starting with getting great pay and rank rewards for work. But the modus operandi of all agencies are the same. A bit People scared. get paid to recruit others, so let's run it down. First, a new player like you heads up to the front desk to apply for a job. You are given a nice shiny badge, a new motto which mm -hmm. displays your rank with cool, the agency, cool. and a hideous uniform. Oh, you are then ushered into great. a training room where your training begins. You are taught to obey commands given to you by higher ranks. Disobedience will not be tolerated and you will be fired for doing so. You were then given a set of rules, like wear your uniform, <laughs> no coloured chat. Wait, well, let me check out these rules real quick. God damn it. Any form of harassment, bullying, or abuse will not be tolerated. Effects are prohibited other than when permitted by the foundation. Dancing is only permitted in the VIP area of the base. Coloured chat is prohibited until you reach 5 IC. Do not ask for pay, promotion, or other benefits. What the fuck am I working there for? Wait, don't ask for pay. What the fuck am I doing working here at the the goddamn Men in Black Society? What? What do you mean? Do not double job or self promote, and always be respectful to yourself and others. What is it? rule four? The fuck? Chat and never ask for pay or promotions ever. There are no workers' rights in Habo. There are no trade unions True, in Habo. Yeah, no there unions. is no safety net or employment protection in Habo. You are told to comply or be sacked. After that, you are taught how to hire new people and work in the front desk. Help others begin their career in the same way someone started your- Why? I can't believe this shit existed. Imagine coming home after a hard day of school and then going to your Habo hotel job working the front desk at a fucking pyramid scheme recruitment facility. Well, how How is this popular? This is mind-blowing to me. I had no clue. I thought the only thing people used Habo for was the same shit me and my friends did. We go on there, we, we go and like... One of their, their, like, open lobbies will dance and say, Fuck you, idiots. As our characters grooving. Like, that's it, you know? I, I didn't know it went deeper than that. 
After that indoctrination session, you are told to begin to recruit new people. As you start pouring hours into working, you begin to be promoted into higher Isn't ranks. Some higher ranks give you privileges, like working in easier jobs oh, like sweet, security man, or you. training, or not. the privilege to stop wearing that hideous uniform, or to be able to use coloured chat. This system of promotions end up cementing your loyalty to the agency and make you spend even more hours in it. Wages can be meagre. Agencies usually advertise that they pay oh, six. Do we have any retired hobo workers? Week, but in reality, the peasants only get paid one coin an hour, and pay is only given at certain designated pay times. After getting paid, you are told to continue working and are threatened to get pay banned if you don't follow their pay policy. Mm. With such low wages, people begin to work in agencies for hours to even get enough coins for some decent furniture for their rooms. Habo no longer becomes a game. Instead, it becomes a medium for your daily commute to work in an agency <laughs> yeah, that pays you little and pretty demands much. your obedience. You but play a course, game pay, where you're just an pay. abused worker. One coin an hour may seem little, but if you're the owner of an agency, having an agency staffed by dozens of workers on minimum wage can still be taxing. So how do agencies make money? The answer lies in power. Mm -hmm. The obedience demanded by corporations on its workers are no accident. People enjoy telling others what to do. Agencies run on a very simple hierarchical structure mm -hmm. where the owners boss around the directors who boss around the managers who boss around the peasants. Rich habos are willing to pay thousands of coins in order to become oh. high ranking agents so they can tell the peasants what to do. So you get to Power buy your position? And he Hold on, I wanna see the I wanna see the going rates here. So it's not so different after all, eh? This looks like some kind of cult organization here, like a, a nefarious evil organization. Like this logo does not inspire confidence. It immediately makes me think of like war crimes. So for an agent rep, which seems to be the lowest on the totem pole here, 3,100 coins. That seems like a lot. Okay, let me look up how much a pack of coins was on Habo Hotel. Let's see what the coin prices were. For $64, you get seven coins. No fucking way that's right. What? I must be looking at that wrong. Hold on, that's definitely not reliable. Hold on. I just want to see what like the, the bundle price is. Because that's where the coins came from. You buy them. Like with real money. Uh, I don't see it. Why am I having such a hard time finding this? Is that right in the chat? 45 coins for $5? Oh, Habo's website is still up. Oh, I can just check here. Oh, this is just club membership. Where's coins? Oh, here we go. Here we go. Uh, you get 20 credits, which is their coins, for $3. So 630 credits, which is their highest offer, is $75. So $75 for 630. And the lowest position here is 3100 that's a lot. That's that's pretty significant. Holy shit. No, it's 3100, not 31,000. You're misreading it. It's 3100 coin. So then the top position of 4500 coin. I'll just do the math. Jesus Christ. I think it's $675 for the first tier. Let me see. Do some basic math here. Yeah. It's, uh, I was wrong. So hold on, let me do all of it. Okay. Okay. 
$375 for the lowest tier and the highest tier is... About 500-ish. So you pay 500 bucks to be a BOE assistant leader. And 375 to be on the lowest end. That's a lot. That That's a fucking lot. Thanks to the Prime, Icy, and the Risa White Wolf. And they give sub Yoshi. It was... Str oh, are you a, a survivor of the Habo agencies? It was structured like a military, and there were pages and pages of guide li guidelines which we had to follow. My god. Well, you're, you're lucky you had the privilege of working here. At, uh... What is this, Axel? Or AL? To pay thousands of coins in order to become high-ranking officials so they can tell the peasants what to do. Power sells, and the agencies know this. And side note, bit notice how there are two sets of uniforms in this agency. One looks decent, and the other looks like a school PE kit. This is because Habbo's premium don't membership look very Habbo good. Club is needed to wear certain items of clothing. Clothing that doesn't make you look like a complete hobo. Habbo doesn't that looks like the shit they wear in the Squid Game. Within its users. It promotes it. Gambling used to be legal in Habbo. Mm. Casinos were a commonplace feature of the game. Pre-2014, the Habbo economy flourished. Mm -hmm, Rare mm -hmm. items were being traded at high prices, which were used to decorate Paradise. the Let's then go. Then the Danish Ministry of Taxation caught on what? and told Habbo to stop letting miners spend mm. real-life money on coins to gamble them away. Because child gambling is illegal. This prompted Habbo... It's to not illegal anymore, gambling, baby! ...but shut down Habbo's largest casino... We love that shit now. ...their owners. This single event has been attributed to Habbo's decline. The gambling ban led to the crashing of the stock market. Values of rare items plummeted as they turned out to be pretty much useless for anything other than decorating casinos, and this Whoa, hit what the Habbo fuck? hard. Revenues from coin sales wild dropped layout. and Habbo ended up having to lay off their staff, leading to anarchy. But with the sacking of moderators, the underground casinos rose. People began to gamble the same way they did back in 2014. But with the gambling ban, Habbo instituted certain restrictions. You could no longer place more than three dice in a room. So people came up with ingenious solutions to overcome this ban. In the past, people played blackjack and poker with a set of five dice, but it's possible to adapt the game so it only requires three. Furthermore, you can this set it so, so that deep. the room only has three dice, and that the dealers of the casino would simply share the dice around. Another solution people Seems came up very with tedious. was wired. Wired furniture was the redstone of Habbo. Wired took an input, and if certain conditions were met, gave an output. This allowed players to the program fuck is this? in their room and make impressive The Green games Bay Packers gambling in here? Games. People used wired to make random number generators which acted as dice. These pseudo dice allowed casino owners to circumvent the dice ban. However, the issue with wired is that only the owner of the room and those with special permissions granted by the owner could view its contents. It is possible to rig anything that involves wired. There have been Obviously. countless stories of opportunistic casino owners rigging their pseudo dice in their favour. Habbo's casino ban inadvertently led to the explosion of con games and scams. Casinos well, yeah, are it, still well, by far the most profitable adventure would. of Habbo Hotel, but not necessarily the way you think it is. Sometimes the admins of Habbo log in. In the absence of moderators, casinos operate in broad daylight, but it's periodically casinos testicles. have been shut down by You're these subsidiary. admins and got their owners banned. So owning a casino is still a risky venture that few dare risk. Casino owners would sell dealer memberships at a high price, usually for hundreds of coins if not thousands. Usually owners would sell multiple tiers of memberships, with the dice sharing membership usually incurring a premium fee since in-game dice can't be rigged. Casino owners could sell hundreds of these memberships, and it isn't unusual to hear them earn tens of thousands 
and hundreds of thousands of coins by selling them. That's equivalent to tens of thousands of US dollars. The risks outweigh the benefits. With no real moderation and a currency backed with real life money, it is easy to see how Habo turned into a virtual a experiment of unregulated capitalism. Many players of the game are teenagers and a sizable proportion of players are adolescent children. Most of them don't have a background in economics, yet the conditions of the game led to the emergence But now they know how to gamble, and that's practices. important. In such a harsh environment, some chose to quit. Oh, Others decided cowards. to make their own communities, oh. a much fairer one than the one Habo offers. But that's a story for another time. Exit Prime, Azur. That was very interesting. I didn't know any of that about Habo. How I made $200 daily playing Habo Hotel. Oh my god. How the teenage players of Habo Hotel turned to financial crime. Oh my god, how deep does it go? Okay, let me do this one first and then I want to see this one. This is from the same guy, so I'm imagining this is a follow-up to this one because it's more recent. I want to see this one first though. When you hear Habbo Hotel, you probably think about autistic kids role-playing, pedophiles hunting them. Habbo Hotel. Oh yeah, he never touched on the pedophiles, pedophiles in the last one. And 4chan raids, or maybe Quackity. I myself think about the game's Maybe economy. One cricket. The currency in Habbo is not obtainable through gameplay. You must Maybe purchase 13, it with real money. Habbo is basically the grandfather of microtransactions. They knew how to scam kids, and boy, did they do it. Just listen to the lyrics in their latest promo video. It's basically subliminal messages. Uh, this is gonna be DMCA. That is pretty on the nose. I remember reading in the newspaper about parents put in debt because their kids use the home phone to buy Habo coins for tens of thousands of dollars. And obviously with the currency only being it purchasable with real money it had quite high real world trading value. Even today 1000 coins is worth about 70 dollars. That's a lot better than some countries. In a game like that you could not trust anyone. There was no contact, but to become wealthier. Friends you knew for years would scam you, if you gave them the opportunity. So how does one make money on Habo you ask? Well there is obviously trading. Some of the furnitures on Habo are worth up to thousands of dollars so, if you knew what you were doing you could turn a profit like that. You could also swap money between Habo and RuneScape with what? favorable ratios. Really? Like buying 11 million RuneScape GP for 50 Habo coins. Is that deal still on the table? That's an incredible rate for gold on RuneScape. So we just look it up. 50 Habo coins was what? It was It was like, I think it was like, what, five bucks? Five or six bucks? You get 11 mil for it? That's some crazy real world trading ratios. Oh man. And then selling 10 million RuneScape GP for 50 Habo coins. But the biggest earners were gambling and scamming. The most common way of gambling is dice games. The player trades a bet to the host, who then trades twice the amount back. That's- uh, hold on, someone's correcting me. That's normal real-world trade price? I haven't kept up on real-world trading scams and all that recently. What- what is the going rate of gold all of, all of a sudden? Let me see. Uh, LSRS. There's so many gold sellers, I can probably just type in gold seller. Let me see. God, every single one of these has an ad next to it, so I know it's a fucking scam. Jesus Christ. It's a little less than a dollar per mil. 65 cents per mil. At least on that one. So no, it looks like the Habo ratios were a little more favorable. What's wrong with ads? Whenever you, I don't trust it. When you go on Google and the first three or four results have ad next to it, I really think that they're all malware. Because anyone can pay for that to go right to the top. And I distinctly remember 
I don't remember what software it was. It might have actually even been LimeWare, honestly. But I got a rough virus from clicking on one of the ads to download the software. Like, so anyone can put Trojans and shit, those kind of awful websites on there on like the first three results with ads. So I, I never trust it. I never click that. I just scroll be, uh, beyond it. If a player wins, but there was no rules on how to oh, against well, thank scamming, you, the host could basically Teresa just ban you from Kraken. his room and keep the bet if he lost. If a player were to report such an incident he would just be told that you should not trust other people with your items and that gambling is bad. To counter this issue... I don't know why I keep pausing this to read some dumb shit. You peddle ads all the time from the same company, hypocrite. Are you stupid? Like, are you, have you ever used Google? Or do you have, like, a parental lock on your computer? So if you go to Google, uh, here, I bet RuneLight still has this. There used to be a, no, they took it down. When you went to Google and did RuneLight, the first thing had an ad there, and it was a virus. Um, but something else that always has ads at the top of a Google search. You have ad block on? No, it doesn't get rid of this. Give me something else. Uh, how about this? Crypto casino. This. This shit. When it has ad. I don't know how dumb you are to think that, like, a Twitch ad is the same as this. Like, even just looking at the names of these websites. BigTimeSlotGames.com, MyJackpot, and Happy Bets. Anyone can pay for this position here. And it can be viruses, and it's happened many, many times. Issue the richest players got together to make huge casinos, where they would sell dealership position to players, which would then be removed, if the dealer were to scam someone. Gold dealership would for example cost 600 coins which would give the player sort of an insurance, that he's okay to take a bet up to 600 coins. But just like in real life the richest players were the last people you should trust. Every month or two we would close down casinos and drive the gambling community towards our new casino. Hosted under a different name. To keep selling dealership positions over and over. This gold badge has 486 members. Whoa. 486 members paying 600 coins is 291,600 coins. Holy if 1,000 is $70 then that gives us $20,000. Imagine doing that a few times. Not bad! Another way to earn was the Banzai Teleport Scam. This item will randomly teleport you to any other Banzai Teleports in the room. Here I have 9 teleports. I placed 4 gold coins which is worth 10 coins. I placed 1 silver coin which is worth 5 coins. And the rest of- DMCA? Why would this be DMCA? It's just- it's just the instrumental track. Why do people keep saying DMCA? I, I can't imagine that the instrumental would be a problem. Right? Of them are empty. One go costs five coins. In theory, landing on each one would take me nine attempts. Thanks, Dark Trio. Thanks for the huge 55 coins. Thanks for your subscription. And there are 45 coins oh, placed sweet. on Thank the teleports. So that would give this game a 50% win lose ratio. Man. After 10 attempts, I won 60 coins. But what not everyone knows, is that you can stack multiple teleports on top of each other. After placing a few more teleports on the empty slots your odds starts to look a lot worse. There are also what we called coin grabbers. These are basically a visual scam. A real suckers bet if you will. What you would do, is roll two dices, and the dices would act like coordinates, so 3 plus 3 would be a win, but rolling a 4, or above on either dice is a loss. Kids would view this as only half the numbers are gone, but in reality only 9 out of 36 possible outcomes is a win. In Habbo there are nice. items called <laughs> These are good These scams, just holy like shit. in the Warcraft 3 editor, if you are familiar with it. So for example by using trigger, user walks on Fernie, and, effect, teleport to Fernie, I can create a teleport. With wards I managed to create a functional card deck inside Habbo. Blue tens are kings, yellow tens are queens, green tens are jacks and blue ones are aces. Using this I hosted a blackjack table. The left lever pulls a card, while the right one resets them all. So basically I draw one for player, one for myself, and another one for the player. 
Let's say player sticks at 15. I draw a second This card. is so fucking Pass deep! Wins. Jesus Christ! But my blackjack table had a catch. I added chat commands using Swedish letters to draw myself 10 and ace on demand. And chat commands are only visible to the user. Whoa, that's so, so again, smart! I draw one for player. One for the dealer. And oh another one God. for the player. Player sticks at 20. I draw myself ace and house wins. This blackjack table was originally introduced on Habbo by me, and boy was We've it got a pioneer here. These are just a few examples of ways we got rich on Habbo. There was a lot of money to be made selling the profits on forums and playerauctions.com. But you don't need to take my word for it. Take the famous player fish for example who quit Habbo oh in 2013. After selling all his belongings he ended up with $55,000. And he was by no means the richest player on Habbo. You Fuck. might think what we did was immoral, but honestly everyone I don't else think was so. out it's to scam you on Habbo. Habbo anyway and we were just kids. If you think RuneScape had a large amount of scammers and lures you don't even know the half of it. If anything this game taught me valuable life lessons. I learned to butter, I learned many of the red flags of someone trying to trick you, and I learned to never gamble. Because remember kids, the house always wins. Now you're probably asking this yourself is crazy. if you can still do this today 2018. I'm sorry to disappoint but this was not meant to be a tutorial, but rather a trip down the memory lane. And Gambling biggest moisty. was banned back in 2014, so Habbo could get a child friendly rating on the app store. There is still gambling going on, but the scene is really dead, and all the gamblers are using Really dead? Look at her busting it out! Band, so there is a Fucking high going risk wild. of getting scammed. Habbo is 18 years <laughs> old, and on its last legs anyway. Unless you're Brazilian. The Brazilian server is bigger than the international one nowadays for some reason. Earlier this year 60% of Sulak's shares got sold to Orange Games. And they also released a new game called Hotel Hideaway, so the end is near. That's all for today. I hope you enjoyed this video. Farewell. That was so that was so fucking cool. I had no idea about any of this shit. Habo seems awesome. <laughs> Holy lord. I can't believe I never got scammed on Habo. I never cared about coins or anything, because to me, like I said, to me and my friends, it was just going on there to mess with people. I wish I got into it, though. I always got scammed on RuneScape and scammed on RuneScape. I remember a buddy of mine on RuneScape. I already told this. Buddy of mine on RuneScape used to do a lot of trade scams back when you could do that. Swapping armor out used to make so much off that. Nowadays, do, are there any modern games where scams are prevalent? I feel like no one scams anymore. Like, does New World have any scams? Like the Prime Hawk. I've already seen the pools closed from Internet Historian. Pools closed is Internet History. Roblox? Roblox has... Oh, Roblox probably has a lot of scams, actually, now that I think about it. It's called Crypto now. <laughs> I meant games. People are begging to be scammed, like, every day in the real world. I'm talking about, like, games. EVE Online always has some incredible stuff. Yeah, EVE, Roblox. I don't know why people are mentioning Rocket League. What scams exist in Rocket League? How can a player scam you there? Like, selling their account or something? I think you give Subqueen of Games. Oh, CSGO. CSGO definitely has a fair sh fair share of scams with, like, uh, lottery sites and all that. Item trading? Okay, so there's still a few. Okay, now let's watch this one. Actually, let me fill up my water before we do this one. This one's 50 minutes. But I I'm too deep now. I've, I've got to see financial crime from Habo. I'm already, I'm already like an hour into Habo research. I'm, I'm expecting the cartel to be operating some kind of business here now. So I'm excited. This can be one second though.
back. Thanks to the resub Mortified and the Prime the Maniac. Habu Hotel is an online prime Momo Kip. aimed primarily at teenagers. The game allows you to explore rooms, Thanks chat with other players, chips. and make your own creations. But most Thanks, importantly, man. it allows you to trade. As Habu's monetization model relies on the purchase of virtual coins, it is in Habu's interest to generate demand for their currency. And over the past 20 years, Habo has meticulously crafted an ultra-consumerist environment to facilitate this demand. This hey, what the fuck is this? The prices have gone up. I, we checked earlier, it was 630 credits for 75 bucks. What kind of nonsense is this? ...in my previous video. But what happens if people don't want to pay for coins? What happens when people get fed up of waiting for some trees like red queues, working in drab corporate jobs, or selling their personal details away in dodgy survey sites? Well, they turn to crime. Over the past mm -hmm, six months, naturally. I've talked to dozens of players Hobo to criminals. the topic of financial crime, logging over 200 pages of interview mm -hmm. transcripts, reading the relevant academic literature on the topic, and even catching people in the act. In this video essay, I will explore how this financial so crime thorough. has evolved over time, how Habo chooses to Dude's like the Batman of Habo Hotel. And finally, give you a personal note. I hope you enjoy. Is it tier one assassin in the resub dino? The bit scrub lord. Back in the early 2000s, the internet was the new frontier of technology, and being new and unfamiliar, it was it's basically the Wild West. Habo Hotel was a game burst during this era, and being an innovative new game, it was rather broken. Scripters were players who basically hacked the game using exploits. They manipulated code within the game. While some scripters did it merely for fun, such as allowing themselves to decorate their rooms better, Others decided to give themselves endless amounts of- Whoa, what the items. fuck is this? This was also a time that actually when is a cult. internet security wasn't much nice. of a thing. For example, it has been alleged that one of the richest players in UK Habo obtained their wealth through one of the largest hacking conspiracies in the game's history. Mm. I would like to point out that I was unable to cross-reference this claim. I'd like to tell you the story anyways, as it helps illustrate a point. Back in 2002, Ione, who was serving as the UK's hey, hotel Ione. manager, gave each player who logged in during her birthday a special gift. Each gift contained one of three items, a throne, a Russian samovar, or a hollow boy. Wow, Collectively, nice goodie bag. these items would be known as the Ione gifts, and they would end up being highly sought after. The throne, in particular, would Why? continue to dominate the market for generations, and its contemporary value sits at around 600 coins, Why was she so special? US dollars at black market rates. Now, let's move forward to 2006. The player made a realization. Most of the recipients of the Iona gifts, the players of 2001 and 2002, were most likely to have moved on from Habo and would have left their accounts abandoned four years later. And so, allegedly, they began to conduct brute force attacks against vast swathes of abandoned accounts, helpfully aided by Habo itself, which decides to publicly display when users have last logged in. These brute forcing attempts were also helped by the fact that back in the day, there were no password requirements. As such, someone could literally set their password as 123456, or password. And in the age where internet security wasn't as prevalent, you can guess what people set their password as. By spamming thousands of username and password That's nuts! They were able to crack account after account, taking both okay, the okay. and the only gift that came with it. And Shitty password. the enterprising hacker that they were, they didn't let the hacked accounts go to waste. Some of these accounts had so-called rare names, usernames which were highly sought after, and players were willing to pay a high price Thanks for some German It was claimed that the Pierre. operation was so profitable that they had to subcontract their work to others to hack accounts for them. Habo eventually caught on to these brute force attacks, and soon required users to log in with their emails as opposed to their usernames, and it also started implementing password requirements. 
old-fashioned hacking was being clamped down and scripting was pushed more and more into obscurity. Enterprising criminals, for the most part, couldn't rely on exploiting Habbo's instability or flaws to get rich anymore. There were clearly successful attempts, such as in 2017, when two players exploited a hole which allowed them to generate millions of coins. But these hacks against Habbo itself became rarer, so criminals Holy had to shit. find another way. But don't so on the front lines of controversy and their desire and crime. to obtain virtual currency. Scams have been ubiquitous in the world of Habbo. Being scammed is such an ingrained experience of Habbo that it acts almost like a rites of passage. Unlike I never hacker, got scammed. I wish I did. Expertise, the scammer I didn't get the full experience. Confidence and charisma. Habbo has an entire page cataloging many common scams on their website, but this video would be a lot longer if we tried to cover every single scam. Back when people still logged in with their usernames, password scams were fairly common. For example, a scammer might this say, Oh one. look, Habbo senses your password. The victim would that was a RuneScape scam. Did it come from the Habbo? Scammer would log into the victim's account and change their login details. If the scammer, I can't. Was I don't think it ever worked though. They tell the victim to type their password and press Control M instead. In the past, Control M acted the same way as the Enter button. Habbo has now since patched this. Another low effort scam involved the scammer claiming I don't think that, that ever fucking worked. Tools to duplicate I refuse to believe anyone coins. was that dumb. All the victims even as a had kid. to do was hand over their coins to the scammer. Then the scammer runs away with the money. This scam happened so often, a counter scam was developed where someone would pretend to be a skeptical yet naive victim. The victim would claim that they were going to give one coin to the scammer as a test to see whether the scammer is legit. If the scammer could double the victim's money, they would hand over a larger sum. <laughs> this is all RuneScape scams! Blood in the water, the scammer would pretend to double the victim's money and hand over two coins. The victim would then run away. As time moved on, oh players my God. became more clued up to these rudimentary low-effort scams. The decline of these low-effort scams were also due to the efforts by moderators, when they existed back then, who would ban anyone who tried to claim that they can duplicate furniture or coins. And so, scams became more sophisticated. Falling Furniture FF is a game hosted on Habu, and it's sort of like musical chairs. The host would play. This game looks fucking lit. Rush to sit on them. You just go the and sit on a toilet seat. The person to not get a seat gets eliminated from the round, and the cycle repeats until a winner is produced. In the past, hosts would ask the loser whether they wish to pay to stay, pay for revenge, or leave the game. Pay for this revenge. This choice is commonly referred to as P2S, what does that mean? rev, or kick. Pay to stay allows the player to. What stay revenge? In the game, they get to like execute someone. A rerun of that round. Usually the cost of pay to stay is one coin or its furniture equivalent. Revenge, on the other hand, allows the player to pick someone else to lose that round. This bizarre mechanic what? essentially meant that any player could effectively pay to kick a player they did not like. Because it was a much more powerful option, That's genius. the price of revenge Actually, is genius. usually higher, around two to three coins. Now here's the catch. When someone is a victim of revenge, they don't immediately get kicked out. Instead, they're given a choice to pay to stay, pay for revenge, or to leave the game. This is so this smart. To the phenomenon of revenge, Kids would absolutely do that out of spite. Battle it out by revving each other. And by revving each other, I mean one person pays the host coins, and then the other pays the host coins, and then they. But you're starting to see how profitable rev wars can be. Scammers, however, began exploiting this business Thanks model. Some and here's how you Ninja. do it. Step one: hire a scamming buddy. This person will be your partner in crime. Oh, that'll do it super. If you Thanks for being so busy. To play with two accounts at once, you could also use an alt account. Step two: advertise a lavish game. If you want to pull people in, you want to make sure that you have a large prize. The larger the prize, the more willing people will be to spend money on P2S and revs for a chance to win a prize. Step three. Make your partner the winner. If your partner is the winner, you can pretend to give them a prize without actually giving them anything. It would give the illusion that you are a trustworthy host and you are able to bag any P2S and Rev money as profit. But how do you reach this stage? Well, if your partner ends up losing a round, they can just Rev someone. They don't actually have to pay you anything, they only pretend to pay you something. If they choose a particularly wealthy victim, they could even start a Rev War. A rev war that your partner That's can't so possibly lose. Smart. What? I'm blown away right now. 
an actual revenge loop and then a scam on top of the scam where you get someone to go in with you that pretends to be like revving a rich player. So that way the rich player revs them back and it just goes on and on and on until the rich player runs out of money and you just say that your friend won. Genius. How? No way kids came up with this. This was absolutely the work of like fucking Bernie Madoff or something. Like he was in here running hobo scams. There's, like, there's just no shit. Like, the fucking Penguin from Gotham was in, in this bitch. Like, this is so actually smart. And also, to the person... Uh, I saw you mention that you lost your account because you gave someone their pa your password on RuneScape. I did the same shit, kind of. When I was a kid, I had an account called Strong Wolfo. It was my main on RuneScape. Or, like, one of my five mains back then. And I, my password was Wolfo. And one guy was teasing me. He's like, I bet your password's fucking weak. And I'm like, no, it's actually really strong. I got a really cool password. He's like, no, you fucking don't. And I was like, yeah, I do. And he's like, oh, well, what is it? And I was like, it's Wolfo. There goes the account. Yeah, so I def I mean, I, I definitely would have fallen for scams 100%. But the one that I always knew I would never do is like the Jagex censors your password. I, I never thought anyone would fall for that. At the end of the day, you count up your profits and split half to your partner in crime. Or you could just ban them and keep all of the profits. Pay to stay scams in their day were one of the most lucrative scams on Habo, and arguably the key to its success was the fact that it was much more sophisticated. Unlike the I can double your money or give me your password scams, what you fell for is worse. Yeah, were it was. Automatically I agree. Incriminating. I got the account to back. That they were working in concert with someone else. I didn't lose it forever, but that did give me a scare. Actually happened, which altogether led to many of the pay to stay scammers not being dealt with. In the end, pay to stay as a concept phased out. It is commonly believed that pay to stay is now a banned practice in Habo, something that also followed the gambling ban back in 2014, but I was unable to verify that this was true. On the contrary, according to the official Habo help page, pay to stay and rev is seemingly allowed. Whatever the case, its long-standing connotation of being an outright scam makes it no longer a widespread practice. Another sophisticated scam is the fake buyer scam. To give some context, Habo's economy is very okay. reliant on okay. merchanting, which is the practice of buying furniture at a low price and selling, selling that for furniture higher. at a higher price for yeah. profit. Big Habos in RuneScape too. Spend so hours much similarity. On end at their shops, waiting for customers to buy their goods, and then spend more hours scouring other shops owned by other Habos to buy more items. Hey, hey Carl. Then they would Good to sell see you, man. Hope you're doing well. items at a markup to get more money to Thanks buy the more items to sell. What was I even doing with my life? The fake buyer scam specifically targeted merchants, and this is how it's done. Step 1. Obtain furniture. These pieces okay. of furniture must be disposed of. Fucking banging furniture in here. A piece of Santa furniture sleigh. that most people will not have, and one that is cheap for you to buy. An example furniture that you could use for this scam are these red pixel furnitures. Most new players haven't seen it before, and if you know where to look for it, you can easily buy 10 for one coin. Step 2. Get yourself an alt account. You could also employ a scamming partner, but it's completely unnecessary, and also you banned them. Step 3. Enter the shop with your alt account. This is the fake buyer. Pretend to browse around with your alt account, maybe make some small talk with the shop owner. If you're feeling daring, you'd even try and buy something to establish a relationship. Step 4. Plant the seed. Ah yes, I was wondering so if you thorough. had red so pixel thorough. furniture by any chance. Chances are, if the shop owner did not display the red furniture in their shop, they probably wouldn't. Ah, 20 coins right. for information? Well, if you do find any red furniture, please contact me as soon as possible. You add them to your friend list and then mention something along the lines of, I'm willing to pay 20 coins for every piece of red furniture that you have. Now that you've planted the seed in their head, they'll be actively on the lookout for this mysterious red furniture. And they'll Step go to your friend's shop or account. your main account. You don't want to attract or arouse suspicion, so you arrive some time later. Oh, actually, your yeah, you just bring the account, the account there. Has your disposable furniture. Oh, fuck, yeah, Again, it makes sense. You the shop, establishing a relationship Cuts out the middleman. The then you inquire, do you buy furniture by any chance? If they don't, ask whether they want to trade. 
chances are a shop owner would be somewhat interested by your proposition. And so, step 6. Make the hard sell. Tell the owner that you're selling rare items like, oh I don't know, this red pixel furniture that you just so happen to have. By offering to sell it at a much lower price than what the fake buyer is offering, like 10 coins, you create an almost irresistible opportunity. Genius! And Fucking genius! And that's how These you are the smartest kids in the world! Piece of furniture that was only worth God 100. damn! The emergence of these Fuck. more sophisticated and complex scams Little baby geniuses out here. Part of scamming and an evolution of financial crime as a whole. As the players of Habo get progressively smarter and more informed about scams, scam artists find themselves having to resort to greater lengths to part you from your money. But scams aren't the only forms of financial crime on Habo Hotel. With corporations playing an increasingly larger role in Habo over the past few years, some players have spotted a new opportunity on the horizon. Corporate corruption. In Jesus Christ. In November 2017, Cess, also known as May, went to the highest office of the Habo White House. Turns out, like, Nintendo's got a sect in here scamming kids. Organization's history, ...and she became the White House's first female president. Meanwhile, Infernum, also known as Craig, was packing his bags. Having served his two-month term, he was now the outgoing president. This war Following is the wild. the footsteps of 14 previous presidents, he now bore responsibility to pass the keys of the presidency to his successor. This democratic transition of power is the cornerstone of the Habo White House. Rarely do tier one McMuffin. Will corporations hold elections for their highest office. And so, as the keys of power were being handed over, a fact transpired. The treasury account was empty. Most corporations had a special treasury account. Any donations or profits earned from sales would be stored in this account. Treasury accounts meant that multiple trusted people could do transactions of the organization's Your power. fucking secret it agent assassin bodyguard sleeping on the job. Fire him. It also led to the problem of $400 worth of coins being embezzled from the treasury with no obvious culprit. Mm. An inquiry was quickly held and soon fingers were pointed at both Cess and Infernum. The heist was done in perfect timing. The transition period between presidencies meant that both Cess and Infernum had access to the treasury account Thanks, at the unicorn. same time. The inquiry went cold, and the culprit was never found. The rise in corporate crime is a more recent phenomenon. As corporations play a much more significant role in the day-to-day -day lives of players, they present greater and more audacious opportunities for any would-be criminals. What do they do? I, I don't understand. Like, what do the corporations do? This actually just looks like some Heaven's Gate shit. Like, everyone's glowing over here, like they're about to go Super Saiyan. Beastly tuxedos talking about Sugar Mama Lauren, like... And here's the dog. What, like, what do the corporations actually accomplish in the game? How are they generating money? We saw in the last video he did that they make money by hiring people to boss people around so they literally get people to pay for a power trip. But he's saying corporations play a role in the day-to-day -day activities of the community. And I don't really see how. From, from everything we've learned about the corporations so far in the last three videos. Exploit. As for our story... The Habo White House learnt its lesson and reformed the Treasury to prevent future presidents from embezzling funds. One of these reforms was to put the hands of the Treasury account to one single trustee, chosen from an elected board. That way, oh my only God. one person could access the account. <laughs> if anything went missing, okay. it was clear who the culprit was. With these reforms in place, the White House had to start over, and through donation drives and sales, they managed to rebuild the Treasury. All in all, they managed to reaccumulate $450 worth of coins and rares. And these treasury reforms ended up working for one year, when in 2018, a trusty called Jess emptied out the entire oh. treasury account after the White House tried to impeach her. She looks like a pirate. Like, why? what was the hiring process like here? I could tell you if I was on the board of trustees and I was vetting for the next person to handle my treasury in Habo, I would not pick this person. They look like a fucking criminal. 100%. We're talking big fucking bucks here. Some huge noodles. I'm not gonna risk it with someone who comes in here with a goddamn eye patch. Uh, it, it's unreal, unreal. They, it's like they didn't even try. For allegedly working for the Habo Mafia. Of course, embezzlement and the Habo Mafia, doesn't huh? just happen in about the right. Habo White House. But with so many careers, livelihoods, and money on the line, 
many people who I approached simply did not want to talk about this topic. A high-ranking official of one of Habbo's largest corporations eventually decided to talk to me under the strict condition of anonymity. In our interview, they made explosive allegations against their corporate founder. They claimed the founder would regularly use the treasury as their personal bank account, <gasps> withdrawing what? thousands of coins at a time to sell in the black market to quote-unquote fuel their clubbing habit. In fact, oh. the embezzlement of corporate Good funds was them. done so frequently, the board of directors actively fabricate numbers in their spreadsheet and under- They have a spreadsheet? A Habo Hotel Corporation treasury spreadsheet of their coins to in-game dollars. And they also have an accountant cooking the books. There's no way these are real numbers, right? From Habo Hotel coins? Like, this can't be fucking right. 236,000 US dollars for Habo Hotel coins? I, I must be misunderstanding this, I think. There's no fucking way. Yeah, is there a Habo Hotel IRS? Next to tier one, Mr. Toxic and the Prime Gav and the Resub Jam and the Prime Resi. I helped run the biggest underground casino on Habo. If you want some solid information, hit me up, brother. Yeah, what were you pulling in monthly? Like, I imagine if these are these re like actual sensible numbers that people were making from Habo Hotel coins and selling them. Or is this just like if they sold them what the total could be like under ideal circumstances? Like how often were you able to flip coins in Habo Hotel to actual USD? I can't imagine it was a booming market where everyone was buying all the time. Like, I, I, I don't know. This doesn't. This, there's no way these numbers have to be. I have to be misunderstanding these. To report the revenue earned to their founder to prevent them from literally sinking the company into debt. In another claim, one of the founder's deputies managed to achieve their high rank by regularly sending gifts to the founder. Over the course of a few years, an estimated total of three thousand dollars worth of gifts were given by this deputy. That's this all. This deputy is the second Compared highest ranking saw? official of the corporation. And, in order to dominate the market further, the founder was even alleged to have tried to create a second corporation. Pouring thousands of coins worth of investment into it, their intention was to monopolize the entire agency the reason, chill. by falsifying the illusion of choice. Workers of said corporation would think that they were working for a rival company, when in fact it was staffed by the same administration, just with alt accounts. If successful, the founder would operate two profitable corporations, doubling their intake. Holy Ten shit. Ten people showed up to its so opening smart. ceremony, and the project was scrapped three weeks later. Oh. When I asked Unfortunately, another high-ranking official of the same corporation to comment on these allegations, they disputed the claims. The founder does not take money from us unless necessary, said the official. They insisted that revenue earned was reinvested back into the corporation. Yeah, it's crazy, k The dig into the company's finances revealed that in 2019, the company's annual turnover was approximately 300,000 credits. That is equivalent to 20,000 US dollars. Okay, were sold. I think this helped illustrate it. This is not US dollars that they're pulling in, it's coins. Okay, that makes so much more sense. It's still a lot of money, obviously, as evident here. But it's it's coins, not two hundred fucking what was it two hundred fifty four thousand U S dollars to two hundred fifty four thousand coins sold at black market rates. A vast majority of the corporation's revenue came from rank sales, which is where an employee some would pay to get a higher rank. Other streams of revenue include selling VIP and special visitor passes, which give privileges to rich people that can afford them. Of that revenue, approximately 70% was spent on wages, totaling up to $16,800 worth of coins. The high-ranking officials that I was talking to also get a slice in the form of commission when they successfully make a sale. On average, Man, what each the of these fuck is Habo Hotel? credits annually. I, ne I, I, I never experienced the any of this. The last 20% is the founder's profit. This is also incredible. Also as a reinvestment fund, which totals up to 60,000 credits, or $4,800. With corporations presenting such lucrative pay for those at the top, it is no longer a mystery why so few want to blow the whistle. Oh my god. Quick text message. Angelic is no stranger to scams. Having been twice a victim, she lost all of her furniture and coins. Okay. In total, she bought over $130 worth of virtual goods legitimately on Habbo Hotel. Oh, you idiot. Going legit in Habbo? 
have simply told her that she couldn't recover her stolen items that she paid for. This is in line with Habbo's policy and terms of service. Habbo defines their virtual currency and goods not as property but as part of the gameplay experience, or, as Habbo puts it, you have no interest, including no property, proprietary, intellectual property, ownership or monetary interest in your virtual currency and virtual goods, which remain our content and property. Pretty hard this line stance. This means that you don't enjoy the same protections with virtual property as you do with real property, because under the Habbo Terms of Service, your coins and your furniture aren't even your property. They belong to Habbo and Habbo could theoretically do whatever it wants with it. The question of whether these terms of service That's are nuts, enforceable is a rather murky question. They throw in Creek and there is live, Elijah. But internationally, there is a trend where countries are beginning to recognize that virtual property deserves the same protection. In one notable case in 2003, hackers gained access to a player's account and stole $1,200 worth of virtual items. A Beijing court found Arctic Ice, the developers of the game, liable for the loss suffered by the player and was forced to reimburse the lost property. That's great! In that case, Good the game publishers him. argued that virtual items are merely a pile of data and could not constitute a thing that could be stolen under Chinese law. The rejection of this interpretation led China to become one of the first countries to recognize that virtual property is entitled to the same legal protections as other forms of property. Furthermore, Arctic Ice also argued that the player agreed to the terms of service which stated that the security of a player's account Here's is a their own responsibility, and by extension, the player is responsible if their stuff gets stolen. This echoes Habo policy, which describes being a victim of a scam as user error, and Habo states that it does not allow for reimbursement for Quote unquote, Damn, they're error. good. Arctic I feel like Habo Hotel was scamming people on the low too. To the lost item. They were in the thick the of it, running casinos. This argument. The higher other ups. countries adopt a similar legal interpretation, Habo's policy may not actually be legally enforceable. In a more recent case in 2012, the Dutch Supreme Court followed suit and held that virtual items can be considered goods which can be That's... stolen. The argument that this is so. F this is crazy. Taking a virtual object in RuneScape is now being labeled as legitimate theft. If I was... Actually, I probably... This is 2013... No, 2012. I would have stopped scamming by this point. Imagine I went to a Dutch prison or something. I get like, fucking deported from scamming people in RuneScape. Holy shit. Well, it's all. This is also an extremely intense case. Took the 13-year-old 13, 13 victim to the home of the co-defendant, where they assaulted and threatened the victim with knives to coerce him and coerce him into logging into his RuneScape account, and then drop the objects in the game environment. Jesus Christ. Thanks, the resub slammed. Virtual goods were mere bits and bytes. Was rejected. Putting legality aside, however, Habo is entirely within their power to reimburse victims of financial crime. In the terms of service, Habo writes that they reserve the absolute right at any time in our sole discretion to manage, regulate, control, modify, or eliminate virtual currency and or virtual goods. Habo actively refuses to do this, instead choosing to blame the victim of a crime by calling it user error. When I tried to contact Sulake, the company that owns Habo, on why they operate such a policy, they did not respond to my request for comment. I'm not the first person to have highlighted the issues of Habo's opaque policies. Seven years ago, in 2013, two professors wrote that the players of Habo are learning to be diligent consumers, buying virtual products that will help to construct their identities and relationships, in a context where everything they produce and everything they appear to possess is in fact owned by a company that remains largely unaccountable for its business practices. The professors claim that children are the primary consumers of Habo. According to a survey done in 2004, 75% of players on Habo were between 10 to 14 years old. Unlike adult consumers, however, children tend to have less resources to defend themselves against unfair business practices. And whose fault is that? In many cases, this Being a child is cringe. Just be an adult, activism, dummy. Wrote the professors. Defend yourself in court. What they regard as injustice by insulting or threatening either the company or the individual moderators. Others develop plans to bankrupt Habo Hotel by creating illegal replicas. Some Hispanic players felt so shafted by Habbo's business practices, they even formed the Habbo Revolutionary Union. Depressingly, these mm -hmm. issues were highlighted seven years ago. What? And in the past seven years, nothing has changed. 
Angelic's tale isn't just one tragic story of someone getting their virtual goods stolen, it is a tale repeated over and over again, a tale Habo has been accustomed to, and one where Habo, in every case, chooses not to act. In fairness, there is a case to be made in Habo's defence. The policy of not reimbursing victims of crime is a standard in MMOs. RuneScape, for example, does not yeah. reimburse victims of scams. In their lost items policy, RuneScape claims that their focus is on the prevention of crime, as opposed to what they call dealing with the fallout and chasing after the harm has been done. The question should therefore be whether virtual goods should be treated differently by the industry as a whole, as opposed to Habo itself. Habo, like RuneScape, also claims that their focus is on warning players about scams and educating players, and to their credit, there is some evidence Thanks of prime, this. Sweet kitten. As mentioned before, Habo has a comprehensive list of scams in their help pages. The issue is, you have to dig quite a bit to actually find it. There is also a pinned news article from 2018 warning people of phishing sites. Habo also hires ambassadors, specifically selected volunteers whose role is to help welcome new players into the community and help moderate public. Is this groups. one of them? DB Cooper over here? Infobus session. This one of your community where they raise leaders? Awareness of certain issues. One of these issues was on scams and fraud. To find out whether these sessions actually worked, I decided to attend one and was immediately greeted by a queue. Each session takes around 15 to 25 minutes, and the bus has limited capacity. Oh my god. These restrictions created a massive line, and I begrudgingly waited for my turn. After some time, the old batch exited the bus, and a new batch of people were allowed in. Only then did I learn I was person 25. The maximum capacity of the bus was 24. Needless to say, I very much wasn't amused. I was finally allowed to enter the bus, and Josh, my ambassador, immediately begins laying down the ground rules. This is Josh creepy. So this is like an official Habo instructional thing for the community? You gather them here in like a, a fucking trailer, and you sit in a circle and Josh looks into your soul? Like, is, does it go one by one? Oh, this is weird. I'm trying to read their conversation. Okay. Then proceeds to tell players not to visit random URLs given by complete strangers. A good tip. They also recommended the use of Habo's safety lock feature, where Habo would Thanks ask users security Cooley. questions before they can fully access their account. Another good tip. Josh also gives password advice, such as changing your password regularly oh, and jo using lots of numbers, symbols, and capital letters. Imagine- oh my god, I, I thought of a cool scam here. Imagine if one of these ambassadors decided to start scamming. So these are obviously kids that are trying to learn about how to be safe on Habo. But imagine, so when he talks about password safety, he like kind of leads them down a path of like, a password that he wants them to get to, right? You know, like a strong password would probably be something like your name plus a couple letters, like one, four, and five. And then you could just take a list of everyone who visited his seminar and just try those kind of passwords in. Maybe get lucky on a few accounts. Josh, maybe we got something here. Which is actually outdated advice. What should have been emphasised instead is the fact that you should use different passwords for different platforms in case one of your passwords get compromised in a data breach. And one way in which you can manage. I meant numbers. Uh, whatever you meant. You know, any I meant, you know password what I meant. manager. That could have been a perfect segue. No one offered to sponsor me, so. Anyways, the session ends, and then we are thrown into the deep end to complete a quiz before we receive a special badge which we can pin on our user profile. When asked to comment, a different ambassador who wished to stay anonymous said that they and their fellow colleagues genuinely believe that their sessions are helpful in educating users. However, they also privately expressed doubts. One of these doubts revolved Things around giving away free prime, badges. Lucan. While free stuff works great as an incentive for people to attend these sessions, they end up mostly attracting veteran and seasoned players, the people least likely to fall for basic scams. These players end up taking up space which would otherwise be more useful to newer players. But apart from writing a few articles and asking volunteer players to run education sessions, Habo doesn't actually seem to be doing that much. Which begs the question, why? Why doesn't Habo do more in tackling financial crime? 
Well, like, what are they, they supposed to do? Hire an investigator? Worry, we can only speculate. No, I, I, we don't have to speculate. It's just, just not worth the money. For example, during my visit, someone hosted a fake giveaway. In this giveaway, the scammer asked people to visit this website to comment on their photo. This website is a phishing website. It's a fake website that looks just like Habu, and oh, it is designed these to steal are, these, people's these were big. information. Once the scammer Not for Habo, this but for RuneScape, they these were the big. Victim's account, steal their items, and change their password so that they can no longer Fuck, access those their were account. Big. What makes the scam so effective, however, is account topping. This is when a scammer uses one of these stolen accounts to set up shop. They advertise the fake giveaway under this stolen account. Once they've run the scam using that account for a few days, they move on to a new stolen account. This is what happened to Angelic. She found out that not only was her account hacked, but it was used to set up one of these fake giveaways. As for Victoria, the person pictured running the scam, her account was stolen too. But not only did she learn that her coins and furniture were stolen, tooly. she learned that her account was being hijacked to run the fraudulent giveaway. Players, none the wiser, began to spread the message through word of mouth that Victoria is a scammer, completely ruining her reputation in the Oh process. no, Victoria. When she tried to contact Habo to recover her account, she received no response. Instead, Habo decided to ban her hacked account oh, for no. scamming. Oh the no. Oh no. and simply moved on to a different account. But this explanation is not satisfying. Rest Firstly, in peace, Victoria. Not scams are this sophisticated. There are still Here's many Sun Man and basic PP scams Go. that are being done without any consequence for the, the scam. Ranger. Secondly, it would put the competence and effectiveness of moderation in question, if it exists at all. This brings us to our second possible explanation, the lack of moderation. The ambassador I spoke to gave harsh and scathing criticism against the state of moderation in Habo, decrying it next to non-existent. While in my previous video I claimed that there were no moderators on Habo, the ambassador informed me that they were told by staff that there were off-client moderators. There's a prime bong water. You flagged content from outside the game. These moderators don't actually log into the game and therefore don't have a clear picture of what actually is happening. If they do exist, they are doing a terrible job, they remarked. But if this is true, this also brings with it a troubling thought. The last time that Habo lacked moderation, this happened. Good evening. It is every parent's terror that their internet literate child will arrive in a make-believe children's web world that is so unsafe that he or she can be propositioned for sex by a paedophile within four minutes. And finally, what? There is a oh, wow. and much more what a speed run! What? On why Habo doesn't do that much. There simply is no fine. Habo's got the sense. fastest pedophiles in the Theory, world. And Joseph Stalin, I guess. Good customer service would overall lead to more customers. That's why businesses tolerate even the most obnoxious of Karens. However, Habo runs differently from other businesses. Why is Joseph Stalin just hanging out? Revolves around the sale of virtual currency, currency that would only be worth something to players that actually play the game. Thanks if five gifts of bong water, appreciate it, man. Chances are you're already deep in it. And maybe Varys. Going back to the paper written by the two professors, they observed that as users spend more time on Habo, they create what is known as social capital, which basically means friendships act as their own currency. When someone stops playing Habo, either by quitting or by being banned, they lose this social capital, in other words, their friendships. As Habo prohibits, or tries to prohibit, people from sharing links to external communication websites like this Discord, they effectively monopolize the social capital generated by their players. Or to put it in another way, the only way to meet your friends is through Habo. What this means is Thanks, that Goose. the cards are effectively stacked in Habo's favor. You can quit if you want, but if you quit, all your possessions are gone, all your creative labor is gone, and all of your social capitals, your friends, are also gone. As one player remarked, believe me, I know what it's like to get fucked up by these mods. You spend money, and they don't even think for a second about your friends, money spent, etc. When there is such a large disparity oh, sorry of to hear that long and fat. And customers, a company no longer needs to oh, entertain the idea of customer satisfaction. You're going to play Habo anyways, and Habo knows you're going to spend more money, so why bother? If you're not convinced by this explanation, or believe it is unduly cynical, just note that when something directly threatens Habbo's financial interests, really the lack Holy of moderation shit. becomes a non-issue. 
In 2017, two hackers made use of an exploit to generate millions of coins into their accounts. Soon, they went on a full-on shopping spree, buying tons of rare items. Their shopping spree generated a surge in demand, and soon the rares market entered into a frenzy. People bought thrones for 500 coins and resold them at 700. Wow. In one instance, two players even bought rare items with their real life money and sold them to the hackers at Martin Price. Let's go. The hackers didn't mind. Getting wild. Overall, they could just generate more coins. Habo <clears throat> caught on, and the admins quickly suspended all trade and market activity on the platform. The hackers were banned along with millions of coins, totaling up to hundreds of thousands of US dollars. If Habu really wants to intervene, it most certainly has the capacity to do so. With Habu currently riding Brian the nostalgia wave of Canadian nothing in a five gift subs MXL current situation, I want to look up that exploit. So they were able to just generate millions of Habo coins. Let's see. Okay, let's see. Wait, what the fuck? Habo NFTs generated $14 million in 24 hours. Yep, that sounds about right. This isn't what I was looking for. This was two days ago. Wow. Man, fucking... That's, that's NFTs for you. Okay, let's see. I want to see how what this uh, glitch was. Can't really find anything on it though. Yeah, it's not worth not worth it. Hiding behind excuses of lack the of prime funding and preparation There's is some no Conrad. acceptable, although it never was to begin with when you're making a game targeted at teenagers and children. When Habo fails to act or appropriately respond, it is a deliberate choice made by its top management. Just to clarify, I don't blame the staff members working at Habo. Over the course of this year, I've seen staff take a more proactive and visible approach, especially in regards to community engagement. But what they can do, and what they can spend time on, is ultimately decided upon by Habo itself, and it's Habo's failings to allocate adequate resources into tackling financial crime that have led Habo to become complicit in it. I wouldn't necessarily say they're complicit in the crime, it's just they don't want to spend the resources on it. Now, I guess you could argue that be, they're Trollibar, complicit. Have you been scammed there. before? And my response is, no, I actually haven't. Not that people haven't tried to scam me before, I've seen it all, but the fact I haven't fallen victim to one is probably due to vigilance and awareness. Now the keen eyed of you would have noticed that I've dedicated an entire part of this video to a personal note, and so in response to your second question, a big tin gift yes, subs, macho. I appreciate yes, I that. Have. I have pulled off some falling furniture and fake Thank you for that, macho. in the past, but that didn't satisfy me. 15 year old me wanted to do something more adventurous, so I began brainstorming for ideas. Although, if you thought this was going to be some amateurish affair, you are sorely mistaken. After doing a painstaking amount of planning, I eventually came up with a master plan, the Arrow Giveaway. If you watched my previous video on capitalism on Habo, you would know that I spent an entire section dedicated to dodgy giveaways. Mm -hmm. The reason why I know so much about them is because I ran one myself. How this successful was it? Worked. Firstly, a user would queue up. Once it's their go, they will pull this switch. This switch can do one of two things. The first thing it can do is move the arrow to the right. And the second thing it can this do pretty is cool. move you to the exit, which means you have lost the game. There is a 50-50 chance of either event happening. If is you're wondering turkey? why I couldn't just break the odds, I deliberately placed the wires, the mechanism to run this game, in plain sight. It was right there, and those who could understand why it could see it. If the user is lucky enough, they will reach a point where the arrow is pointing to a prize. If this happens, the user is offered two choices, risk or keep. If they say keep, 
they get the prize indicated on the arrow. If they say risk, they pull the switch again, with a 50% chance to win a greater prize and a 50% chance of losing everything. Now that I have a game made, next I needed to figure out a monetization model. The predominant way Paper of monetizing pull, games right? like these is with FastPass. This is when a oh, user pays what? the owner a membership fee, something like 20 coins, to get oh. instant or near instant access to the game. There can be other benefits, such as a chance to win a greater prize not available to the peasants. I didn't go for this route. While it was certainly legal, albeit ethically dubious, it most certainly wasn't a sustainable route. When someone purchases uh, fast pass, they only do it once. Noir. You can charge someone as high of a price as you want, 20 coins, 50 coins, 100 coins, but the goal of a fast pass purchaser is to get their money back and profit. If you give them unlimited and unfettered access to your game, they will eventually make their money back and you will begin operating at a loss. Fastpass True. operators deal with this with a variety of solutions. One way to deal with this issue is to simply host less. If you host the game less, your Fastpass customers simply have less time to win prizes, which reduces their chance of making their money back. But if you host less, you oh, sell nice less Fastpass. Okay, it's it just out. that simple. The second solution is to pack up your bags and leave. Once you sell enough fast passes, you stop hosting, close down the giveaway and open it under a new name where people have to buy a new fast pass. The issue with this, however, is that this will inevitably trash your reputation. You could try and avoid this problem by moving everything to a new account and is it tier one a new Alexa? with that account. But this is way too much work for my liking. And the third solution is to make fast passes time limited. You put an expiration date when you remove someone's fast pass. This seems like the most sustainable option, but it still falls into the pit trap where people are unlikely to pay for fast pass a second time. If your fast pass purchasers are unable to recoup their losses for the first time, they're not going he to. He really did think this membership. through. Then one day I visited someone else's giveaway and saw a novel innovation. Rather than charge for fast pass, they had two queues. One was the peasant queue, and the other was the donator's queue. How it worked was people who wanted to donate lined up in the donator's queue. When they reach the front of the donator's queue, they pay a coin or an item to the host. The host will then give them access to the game. The peasant and donator queues are run concurrently, but as more people are lined up in the peasant queue, the donator's queue is inevitably quicker. To sweeten the deal, however, donors got a chance to win higher prizes. This was a much hmm. better monetization model. Okay, okay. Every time someone wanted to use the donator's queue, they had to donate something. This meant that the scheme was sustainable. It was effectively a pay-as-you-go model. It was also it much more open to others. Fastpass schemes tend to target Habbo's middle class, players who are desperate to earn any coins they can, but are also in a position to splash 50 coins for a fast pass in the first place. With this system, even a person with one coin could join the donator's queue. And also, being rather bold, it allowed me to claim that I was not running a fast pass system. So, I just mixed the idea. For further profit, I planned to sell host licenses. This is so price fucking thorough. You could host my game in my absence. Any payments you received, you could profit from. This also was a further positive for my scheme because it helped promote my brand name. When I opened my Arrow giveaway, is I didn't Brian expect Park? it to become an instant hit. It was so successful that in the span of two months, I was able to afford an entire renovation of my room. It cost 200 coins and was entirely unnecessary, but it was so successful that I decided it's, to do it. It's a great renovation. And if you're about to comment that 200 coins is nothing, wealth is relative. But why was it so successful? I don't actually know, but I speculate that it's because it's almost like legalized gambling. With fast pass giveaways, the goal of the fast pass purchaser is to make their money back five, and earn profit. With my giveaway, you're paying for a premium go at a game that is pure random chance. Many of my frequent donors actually pointed out that they get the same buzz from my giveaway as they would get from casinos and grabbers. The difference is who? the latter is banned. Who? I what? Should I covered my tracks. Like Habo casinos or like real world casinos? My random chance game was not gambling because unlike gambling where you must pay for a go, you could just line up in the peasant queue for a free go and win free prizes. And I ended up being right, because whilst Matilda, an admin of Habbo, once visited my room and had a go at my game, they complimented me and my staff for running the giveaway and then just left us alone. So you might be wondering, 
I ran an ethically dubious borderline casino giveaway, but that's not illegal. So He's a prime the crusade. Aspect of it? And the answer is, well, it was rigged. I told you earlier that I placed the wide in plain sight and so it was not possible for it to be rigged, but I still managed to find a way to do it anyways. To explain specifically how I did it, I'm going to need to give you some background. Wired is the redstone of Habo. What it allows people to do is to make functions. Each wired function this guy's requires fucking an smart. And output. You can tell which is which because inputs are brown boxes and outputs are silver boxes. To make a function, you stack the two boxes together. For example, this input box checks to see whether you have double clicked an item, like a switch. This output box, meanwhile, allows you to change the state of an item. If a door is locked, it will open, and vice versa. By stacking these two boxes together, we have created a wide function that allows us to control this door using this switch. There is also a third type of wired, conditions. If you add a condition box to your stack, your wide will only perform a function if that condition is met. For example, this condition box checks an item state. I can set it up so that you can only open a door with this switch if this light is turned on. If the light is turned off, this is <laughs> so happen. big brain. Now let's I'm already getting lost. Of wide I showed you Jesus earlier. Christ. This input box takes an input from this switch. This oh, box so is deep. Random effect. When it is placed in a wide stack, it makes it so that only one randomly chosen effect is triggered at a time. Finally, there are my two effect boxes. One is a teleport effect that will teleport you to the exit, which means you lose. The other is a move effect, which moves the arrow towards the right. As we have the random effect box, instead of having both effects happen simultaneously, only one will be randomly selected. This setup on its own is not rigged. You genuinely have a 50-50 chance on whether you move the arrow or teleport to the exit. But I hacked the code. Role in wide, however, and that is each stack of wide is its own function. But the stack does not have to be continuous. You can have an input and an output box separated by air, and the function still works. So if we look what? up, you will notice an additional piece of wide I didn't talk about. That box is a condition box. Wait, but it will what? only allow this function to activate. If oh it's my god! I also have I feel like it's the wide fucking function. ending to the prestige. In this function, the input is the same oh. switch. The output box is teleporting to the exit, and the function only operates when the light is off. What a twist! Up, I can make it so that if the light is on, the game works as normal. But if the light is off, you are 100% guaranteed to teleport to the exit. I can flick the light to set the game so that it is either in normal mode or rigged mode. Oh now, my if you god! Something, you will realize that when the game is in a normal, unrigged state, the wide boxes activate and play a small animation. When the game is in a rigged state, those wide boxes are not activated and so they don't play this animation. So to create the illusion that the wide boxes are activated, I simply created another wide function. The input is the switch, and the output is this, which allows oh, me to change the state oh. of an item. I showed you previously that it can open doors, but it can also turn on lights, do this, and most importantly, trigger the animation effect. Only the owner and those with rights given by the owner can look inside of these wide boxes. So the Even if I could look in them, I wouldn't understand them. This is so deep. Is if it looks legit. This is actual just engineering. I my wide set up, or some of it, in the public view to give the perception that I was fully transparent. I went through all of that trouble just to make my game look authentic, but, more real than the other Okay, games. but the, I, I, I don't know if he's about to address this, but if it, the secret really was just zooming out far enough to be able to click the light into a rig state, couldn't any one of the players just zoom way out and see that? Or am I, am I missing like a crucial piece? Because anyone could have done that. Like, I'm sure there's some player out there that plays in, like, turbo zoom-out mode that could have seen the floating stuff. So you can only zoom it out that far if you're the owner? Okay, okay. There's the prime will cloud. Thank you for that, Mouse. M Moose, sorry. I, I got so into the video, I didn't even see the 10. Thank you for the big 10.
Yeah, we were learning about those earlier, Telefax. Okay. That were actually legit, as placing wide in public view is not standard practice. People could see the wire churning away every time a user clicked the switch. No one would have suspected that there was a piece of wire up in the sky. But just in case, I put a present up there to oh, obscure the view. Now, I should just let I it ride for one more this. second. I could have made my giveaway completely legit. The way I set up the game meant the odds were in my favour to begin with. Statistically, over time, this was a profitable business venture. But this still didn't give me enough control of the game. I wanted to be able to control specifically what prizes I was going to be giving out. Oh, so he, oh my god, I see. Harder to obtain, there will still always be a chance that someone actually wins it. And that means you'll always have to be prepared to pay the five give subs, Alexa. And I wasn't willing to do that. Some I decided to tell my story because I wanted to Maurice show that the ultra consumerist environment where your social standing is defined by the coins in your wallet, the furniture and rares in your possession, and your membership of a premium club creates an extraordinary and insatiable demand for coins. I really appreciate and it, Alexa. Teenagers being the perfect demographic to psychologically manipulate, they are the ones that are willing to do extraordinary things to get virtual currency. I personally ran my criminal enterprise with no nefarious intent to make real life money. I just wanted furniture so I could furnish my rooms and make cool things, something that Habo has decided to lock behind a paywall because it's their monetization model. But the environment that Habo crafted led 15 year old me to become obsessed with these virtual coins and I ended up concocting a ridiculously over the top conspiracy to obtain it. Yeah, it, it's I spent genius. Way too long planning meticulously every detail from monetization to how He's I like was an anime villain without getting caught to how I would present myself as the real deal. What I did was not some large scale hacking operation or setting up a phishing site, but at the end of the day what I did was still wrong even if it was comparatively minor. And it's something I genuinely regret doing, and something I've never done since. Oh, you coward. Be proud of the scam. Though maybe, like, he scammed someone so hard will that they, they, like, really crime. got sad. This is a simple or truth. formed that a gambling what addiction. What has shown is that players Possible. will find new and innovative ways of defrauding others, no matter how the game progresses. However, the current industry of MMOs do not respect the rights of virtual property that people possess, despite the fact that they are materially worth something. Maybe this is for the better. After all, if every MMO had to legally reimburse victims of financial crime, they would be inundated with yeah, a true, big of rich. Cost, including by those willing to exploit that very system. But maybe there should be a re-evaluation. Players spend real life money on obtaining these virtual currencies and goods, and these items end up having lots of sentimental value attached to them. If we believe that virtual items should be afforded the same rights and protections as ordinary property, we should expect to reform the law, as opposed Thanks to waiting for nips. the entrenched industry to regulate itself. As for Habo more specifically, more needs to be urgently done. If Habu insists that prevention is better than cure, it needs to make sure that its preventative measures are actually working. Hiring a bunch of volunteers to run occasional bus sessions is not enough. Pending a news article warning about fish scams is also not enough. Because at the end of the day, if people can still flagrantly host fake giveaways advertising dangerous external links, people are going to fall for it. There needs to be in-game moderation shutting down these blatant scams, and there needs to be a more concerted effort into rooting out these scammers. Having a visible and vigorous approach to tackling financial crime will go some way to deterring future attempts by enterprising players. As for my own story, I still have regrets. Some of the coins and furniture that I have in my possession were illicitly gained. Yeah, so they were. Them, though. But I decided that the only way to repent for my sins was to give it all away. No! What? I will admit it was extremely difficult to do. I was attached to my coins and my furniture which I've earned over the past few years. My wide collection and my Damn, prized he really felt bad. has sentimental value to me. But I decided to do it anyways, and there was no turning back. It was certainly gratifying, however, to make someone's day. Thanks, Arisa. Maddox anyways, and Belly. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you have a nice day. This was such a fucking interesting rabbit hole. Oh my god. This was so good. Thanks for some KQP. Man.
The only way to wind down after that is to watch some slapping. <laughs>